We'll get into that a great deal here in just a couple of minutes. <clears throat> now, how many of you know that when these states ratified that Constitution, they did so in a document? And they said, okay, here is, and I'm going to read them to you, three of them. They said, okay, if we're going to ratify this Constitution, here is under what conditions we will ratify this Constitution. Now, the Bill of Rights came about because Madison and the rest of them realized that Patrick Henry was stirring up a storm and he was going to have a new Constitutional Convention if they didn't get some Bill of Rights into this thing. So they knew they had to do something. They knew they had to put this together. Now, listen really carefully. And I'm going to send all these to you. Now, they'll be bold and highlighted. These are critical, and I've watched and watched and watched them. People just don't understand these. Nobody's, I've never heard anybody use them or mention them. Of course, I found them in the National Archives. But I haven't found them in a textbook. So the first thing I'm going to read you is the ratification letter from the state of Virginia. And they go into the first detail, we, the people elected to do blah, 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 to look at this Constitution and to vote for its uh, ratification. Do in the name and in behalf of the people of Virginia <coughs> declare and make known that the powers granted under the Constitution being derived from the people of the United States may be resumed by them whensoever the same shall be perverted to their injury or oppression and that every power not granted thereby remains with the people and at their will that therefore no right of any denomination can be canceled abridged restrained or modified by the congress by the senate or house of representatives acting in any capacity by the president or any department or officer of the united states except in those instances in which power is given by the Constitution specifically for those purposes. Hmm. Now what did Virginia just say? You violate the Constitution, we're out of here. We're going, back. Yeah. we're going to resume our powers. And we retain sovereignty. And we retain our sovereignty. <clears throat> you can't, your, your sovereignty cannot be taken from you. If it was, it wouldn't be sovereignty pretty simple. So, wow. Virginia said, hey, we're with you until you start messing with this thing. And when you start messing with this thing, we're out of here. Now, another state. I'm going to read you theirs. New York. That all powers is a, that all power is originally vested in and consequently derived from the people and that government is instituted by them for their common interest, <clears throat> protection, and security. That the enjoyment of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are essential rights which every government ought to <clears throat> respect and preserve. <clears throat> that the powers of government may be reassumed by the people whensoever it shall become necessary to their happiness, that every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by the said Constitution clearly delegated to the Congress of the United States or the departments of the government thereof remains to the people of the several states or to their respective state governments to whom they may have granted the same, and that those clauses in the said Constitution which declare that Congress shall not have or exercise certain powers do not imply that Congress is entitled to any powers not given by the said Constitution. But such clauses are to be construed either as exceptions to certain specified powers or as inserted merely for greater caution. Then we go to old Rogue Island. <laughs> How many of you knew that when George Washington took his seat as president of the United States, there were only 11 states in the Union? Two states were not in the Union at the time. North Carolina had three ratification conventions and voted down the Constitution all three times. 
Rhode Island took a popular vote and voted down the Constitution. Nope, we don't want it. That's where the Baptists started. So the... Uh, so the... Uh, <laughs> I try to be nice. I really do. <laughs> and I came from the South. <laughs> Southern Baptists. Yeah. Well, these were American Baptists. Do you know the difference right. between a Southern Baptist and a Northern Baptist? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll ask you for your... Uh... The Northern Baptist says there ain't no hell, and the Southern Baptist says the hell I ain't. <laughs> 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 so having grown up as a Southern Baptist, I feel somewhat qualified to speak on the Southern Yeah, and some of them go to hell. So Rhode Island and North Carolina people were coerced into the Union. After the country was started, every, uh, Washington is seated within months New York, I mean, I'm sorry, North Carolina and Rhode Island were told if you do not come into the country, you will be treated as an enemy. So then they had ratification conventions and they came into the Union. That's under coercion, I believe, would be the proper term. But Rhode Island came in and it says we want to declare and make known in that there are certain natural rights Oh, I love that word. What's a natural right? From God. Yay. Or it's inherent within the person, actually. That is something you have because you are. That's yeah. right. You, right you know what? Shelter. You, the right you know to what? To find food. You have the right to uh, exist. Those can't be taken away from you, but you can't give them away. You can give them away. We've been doing it for decades. <laughs> Certain natural rights of which men, when they form a social compact, cannot deprive or divest their posterity. That's powerful. Among which are the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. That all power is naturally vested in and consequently derived from the people. That magistrates, therefore, are their trustees and agents, and at all times amenable to the people. I've reminded a few federal officials of that, and they don't like that. Mm -hmm. They don't like the fact they're supposed to be amenable to me. As a matter of fact, and I'll tell you this, uh, I made a lot of noise in three counties, Dolores, Montezuma, and La Plata, about certain unconstitutional measures that have been taken by our member of Congress. Now, he had a representative in Cortez when he first took office, a fine young man, former Marine sniper in Iraq by the name of Chris Quintana. <clears throat> well, Chris and I became very close friends, certainly not because of his job. I like him in spite of his job. <clears throat> but we got together and started comparing our military experience. What's the difference in being a sniper in the jungle and being a sniper in the desert and urban society as to a rural atmosphere? We talked about calibers. We talked about all kinds of stuff you women wouldn't be interested in at all. Well, most of it. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry, honey. Uh, so we became very close friends. Chris had a son who was born, and two days after his son was born, he had open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. So the doctor told Chris, you got to get that kid and get out of this altitude. The kid's not going to survive if you don't. So he gave up his job working for our representative, and he moved. 
Well, I kept challenging Mr. Tipton on his unconstitutional moves. And I did it in person a couple of times. And we had a meeting on water rights in Cortez where he attended and there were several people came up to me afterwards and said, we noticed when he left, you're the only person he wouldn't shake your hand. Hmm. And I said, wow. I'll mark that up as a positive. But within a few short days, his, at the time, chief of staff here locally or in the state, in the counties, Mr. Scott Strike, called Chris Quintana in Washington, where he was living, state of, not D.C., and said, Chris, is there any way possible we can get you to help us shut him up? <laughs> so, you know, I didn't get a Christmas card from him, and I was just heartbroken. <laughs> um, but I do want to finish reading you the rest of Rhode Island's, because this is good. That the powers of government may, may be reassumed by the people whensoever it shall become necessary to their happiness. Same thing said in all three of these documents. Mm -hmm. That the rights of the states respectively to nominate and appoint all state officers and every other power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by the said constitution clearly delegated to the Congress of the United States or to the departments of government thereof remain to the people of the several states or their respective state governments to whom they may have granted the same, and that those clauses in the said Constitution which declare that Congress shall not have or exercise certain powers do not imply that Congress is entitled to any power not so specified in the Constitution. But such clauses are to be construed as exceptions to certain specified powers or as inserted merely for greater caution. Now let's get to the legal ramifications here. We've got three states that said if we come into this union, we have the right to leave if you usurp your power. Now, one of two things is true. Either all the states have that power by the next clause on the next part of the Constitution, I'm gonna read you. Either all states have that power or Virginia Rhode Island and New York have never been states. Article 4, Section 2 of our U.S. Constitution states, the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. If the citizens of those three, three states have these rights, so do we. And then we have, and I'm sure you're familiar with the old equal footing, Linda. Equal footing explanation. Madison insisted, <clears throat> now listen to this, we're going back to Bill Clinton of his era again. Madison insisted, and I quote, the western states neither would nor ought to submit to a union which degraded them from an equal rank with the other states. Now you do know there was a big move among the 13 original colonies to make every other state admitted after the 13 subservient to those original 13. They wanted them to be like counties to the original 13. What was the first state admitted to the Union other after the original 13? Kentucky. Yeah. Because Kentucky was actually Virginia. Yeah, it was part of Virginia, wasn't it? So was Ohio. Ohio was the fourth, if I'm not mistaken. And after Virginia was brought in as a state, it ceded these lands to the federal government in partial payment or in complete payment of their war debt. 
And then they became states. Seated was in the national session? Well, not so to speak. They said, here, they're yours. So uh, in the Virginia Ratification Convention, those crazy independent people who like to live in rural parts of America, which Kentucky was at the time, were the thorns in the side at the ratification convention because something funny about rural people. They won't be free. And they were Westerners, even Florida was Westerners. Yes, <laughs> they were. <Not> Westerners. <laughs> and one of the things I'd like to address because people, I talk about how much I care about Thomas Jefferson, and people say, well, the Louisiana Purchase was unconstitutional. Jefferson said so himself. And he asked for an amendment to make the purchase of the Louisiana Purchase to make it constitutional. His Secretary of State said, not necessary. The Secretary of State was James Madison. But there was an external. Now, I'm not, please don't believe that I agree that anything external that's causing pressure gives anybody the right to violate the Constitution. That's not my point here. <clears throat> but France had control of New Orleans. And France had threatened to shut down the Mississippi River. So Jefferson sent Madison to Paris to negotiate to buy New Orleans. Because if they shut down the Mississippi River, the commerce coming out of the western states was dead. They were landlocked. They would have to send everything they produced all the way across the country to the eastern seaboard. <clears throat> so Jefferson, uh, Madison goes to Paris and he says, Hey guys, how about selling us New Orleans? We'd like to buy that. Because France had just gotten it from Spain in a war move. We really would like to buy New Orleans. And uh, so the representatives in France said, well, hey, have I got a deal for you? I'm going to sell you New Orleans and a whole bunch of other stuff we hadn't even looked at yet, west of the Mississippi River. Tell you what, we'll sell you all that for 15 million. And so Madison gets back in touch with Jefferson, and Jefferson then went about. They paid the debt off for 15 million in five years, which is remarkable for the Louisiana Purchase. For those days, that was incredible. And so Jefferson was upset in his later life that he had even allowed that to happen because it was unconstitutional. Even though his Secretary of State said, no, no, we're good, we're good. But he still felt that. But the thing that Jefferson said was the worst moment of his life is when he agreed to make all of the state's debts a federal debt in exchange for Washington, D.C. being in Virginia, the 10 square miles. And that trade was negotiated in New York in an apartment. Three people sat down and negotiated that. James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton wanted that debt. National. He wanted it as a national debt. Because Hamilton said debt's a good thing. The more of it we have, the better we are. Sounds like a banker's perspective. Yeah. Uh, really. Yeah. <laughs> I go back to my original point. But then what he did with that, once he got the debt, was incredible. We didn't have 24-hour news back then. We didn't have a lot of these things happening. So Hamilton, immediately after making this deal that we